I'd like to welcome you all um, to this uh, webinar, uh, the first in our series of five consecutive uh, events uh, for, on five consecutive Tuesdays at uh, 6 p.m. Uh, GMT plus three, 5 p.m. Uh, Central European time, uh, titled uh, the Odessa Talks. And, and uh, before we launch into our discussion today, I'd just like to say a, a couple of things as to what these Odessa talks are about. Um, they're within the framework of, of, of uh, an event that we used to organize in Odessa uh, before COVID, uh, the International Neighborhood Symposium, where many of the partner institutions, all the partner institutions actually were involved in this, uh, in this event. Um, I, my name is Dimitri Dafilu. I represent the Center for International European Studies at Kadir Has University in Istanbul. And, and uh, with me, two of the, uh, of the three speakers are also representatives of uh, the institutions that were part of this, uh, uh, the Neighborhood Symposium, together with the CIS, Hannes Swoboda, who is the president of the International Institute of Peace that's based in Vienna, Hannah Scheles, that represents two of these institutions. Uh, one is uh, UA, Ukraine Analytica, and the other one is uh, the Foreign Affairs uh, Council, Ukrainian Prism, both based in, 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 um, in Ukraine. And, and uh, our other partner is also an NGO called Quadrivium, uh, a Ukrainian partner. Uh, and, and so we've, uh, you know, we had online conversations ever since uh, um, the Russian invasion began, started thinking as to how we could at least online communicate and, and start these events in honor of uh, Ukrainians uh, fighting to defend their homeland. And of course, Odessa, which is a town that uh, we are all, uh, we all know and care for. And of course, Hannah, uh, who is, is from Odessa and, and she is in Odessa and we're glad to have her here. And, and together with us and these institutions, we also have some partner institutions, the Institute for European Policies and Reform, that's uh, that's in Kishinau and Moldova, uh, the Black Sea Trust for Regional Cooperation based in Bucharest, that's been a longstanding partner, the Institute for International Relations um, in, in Athens and, and Global Academy, which is a, a new think tank based here in Istanbul. So this is a sort of, a, you know, the neighborhood symposium was supposed to bring youth from the wider neighborhood together, that that's the idea behind the format. And we would meet for a period of three or four days to discuss different security issues and other issues of relevance. Um, but we've decided to go through this online format, have these small conversations uh, for about 75 minutes. And this is uh, the first one on, on the Russian invasion of Ukraine and its consequences. And, and with us, we have three speakers um, today. Um, I've already introduced two of the three, but I'll just say briefly a few things about them. Uh, Hannah Celeste, who is uh, the head uh, of uh, the security program at the Foreign Policy Council Ukrainian Prism and the editor-in-chief of UA Ukraine Analytica. She holds a PhD in international relations with a specialization in conflict resolution and security issues, a, 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 a widely published author, uh, countless publications on, on conflict resolutions and security issues, and a recipient uh, of a number of fellowships. Uh, she has been Rotary Peace Fellow, John Smith Fellow, Marsh Memorial Fellow, uh, among many others um, over the years. We also have Hannes Swoboda, who is the president of the International Institute of Peace. Um, he has had a long career in the European Parliament, uh, where, be, where he also became in 2012 the president of the Progressive Alliance of Socialists and Democrats. Um, he holds a PhD and an MA in economics, and he's an active uh, as a board member or, or president on an, uh, in a number of organizations, such as the Sir Peter Ustinov Institute, the Vienna Institute for International Economic Studies, and the Bruno Kreisky Forum for International Dialogue. Um, and our third speaker is, is James Rogers, who is a co-founder and, and director of research at the Council on Geostrategy UK-based in London, who specializes in geopolitics and British strategic um, policy, has previously held positions at uh, uh, the Baltic Defense College and uh, the UN Institute for Security Studies. I, I was there too for a while, but we've never, our paths never crossed. Uh, and he often gives evidence at different committees in, in the House of Parliament in the UK. So, uh, the topic is simple, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, simple, complicated, it's dominating our life uh, and its consequences. And what I've asked the speakers is uh, 
to um, give us a start off with uh, about 10 to 12 minutes of prepared remarks about how they view this, the Russian invasion and, and its consequences. And then we'll open up the, the floor to, to discussion. Um, please keep your mics off uh, and your questions. You can ask them in the chat uh, and, and then I will uh, transmit them to the speakers. So Hannah, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dimitri. So uh, very glad to be uh, even online and that we have the opportunity to continue our Odessa talks uh, that have uh, been for so many years uh, uh, in uh, offline and uh, uh, now uh, first we had the difficulties because of the COVID and now unfortunately because of war. But it seems to me that those questions that we've been raising all these years and um, discussing the security challenges in the Black Sea region, the importance of different countries or the new risks, uh, now it is like the quintessence of all those issues that we've been discussing for the last 10 years. And uh, um, really now we are in the situation where we cannot say yet uh, how everything will be in the several, um, even months, not speaking about the years. So we can analyze the certain patterns, what's happened, what already some of the lessons learned that uh, we can probably uh, study from the, the last three months. What are the consequences for the region? But at the same time, we really understand that we haven't reached the peak yet. We haven't reached the bifurcation point after which we can say where are the security are in Eastern Europe, in the Black Sea region are going on. And there are still so many scenarios that are even difficult to choose few. And unfortunately, we cannot, even from the purely academic of view, to say that is the good um, case scenario, best case scenario, worst case scenario, because each scenario can lead us to the very um, unpredictable um, consequences uh, for the region and for the uh, countries. So what we are talking now, um, definitely I'm not going to retell the situation on the ground because it, it's all in the news. And I hope that those who are with us today are definitely following this news. However, there are several ideas that we need to, uh, uh, to emphasize. First of all, is definitely that, uh, let's be honest, all of us underestimated the uh, uh, probability of the threat. All of us being theoretically discussing uh, uh, could Russia attack or not, but all of us being thinking rationally. And I remember all our talks in January, even in the beginning of February, it was like, um, can uh, the Russian president uh, make such an order? Yes. Will he do it? Most probably no, because the consequences for the Russian Federation would be uh, much worse than for many other countries. That's been the uh, most realistic scenario at that time. However, as the reality demonstrated that irrational and emotional decisions are still driving the policies and still the desire of the small group of people can uh, um, drive the uh, uh, extreme conditions and extreme warfare just in the middle of Europe. And uh, we cannot anymore say that Europe is safe because we are civilized, because we uh, uh, care about human rights, because we care about, uh, and we learned the lessons of uh, uh, wars from the past. So that's something we are probably uh, uh, just as safe as uh, uh, possible insured after the uh, uh, previous wars. Uh, and uh, at the same time, uh, it's not only the question of our rational against um, emotional uh, understanding of the situation, but that's also probably clear demonstrated, I mean, the, the unprovoked war that we are experiencing the last uh, three months is that um, We've been talking for the last 30 years that most of the European Union and NATO member states, they, um, they passed by the Cold War. They passed by those grievances and the um, uh, probably uh, accusations and some difficulties that they had against their um, eastern part of, uh, of Europe. They already started living with a different paradigm of relations and um, thinking about cooperation, about partnership about how to solve the issues of the soft security, thinking about them as more influencing the current stage. So it been like the policy of the 21st century. It's been looking ahead and for the future development. We've been talking about the green economy and cyber threats. We even stopped talking that much about terrorism because it's been something far and not that much like, I mean, more moving terrorism to the organized crime uh, level of, of threats for us. 
But uh, at the same time, in Moscow, we saw the completely different process of the last few years. One has been not looking forward, but looking back and with each day even uh, deeper in, the, uh, uh, in history, with returning back to the ideas of genocide, elimination of nations, limiting the human rights, and looking to all others as a threat. And everybody who is around only as a threat and as a competitor, and return to the use of forces as the only way of dealing with the foreign policy, uh, instead of uh, real negotiations. Because it seems to me that those uh, negotiations that we had in December, for example, in January, uh, between the Russian Federation leadership and the NATO or um, uh, US leadership, clearly demonstrated that it's been just uh, for the show. It was a show off um, and uh, taking a little bit of buying a little bit of time rather than the real desire to solve the issues that existed, the um, uh, contradictions that existed by the peaceful means. So that is those preconditions with which we came and that still significantly influence the, uh, um, the current situation and they will influence the final solutions uh, of the uh, um, current war. So uh, um, these three months has demonstrated that um, there is still uh, um, those military and politicians who don't care about uh, war crimes, uh, about uh, um, any type of the uh, uh, destructions, about the use of the prohibited weapons, because for one, the goal is not to gain uh, um, just a small territory, or uh, but to destroy uh, everything around. Uh, uh, there is no uh, uh, prohibited means of warfare. And fear is much more important than uh, the final result or how many soldiers are dying on the battlefield. With this in mind, why it is necessary to understand, because we return, we return back to the talks about nuclear weapons use. Let's be honest, for the last uh, 10 years, if we talk about nuclear weapons, we talked about crazy North Korea or about radical Iran. We were not speaking about like the nuclear weapon possibility use. We've been talking about it only as a deterrence um, uh, uh, instrument. But at the same time, uh, what the Russian Federation demonstrated uh, that how wonderfully they are using nuclear as the blackmail instrument. And uh, uh, here I'm emphasizing this idea of the blackmailing because uh, we really follow now the reaction of the many European politicians each time the Russian Federation is saying about the nuclear weapons. So nuclear weapon is still... Uh, um, efficient as the deterrence, but at the same time as the um, uh, probably the, the tool how to persuade others uh, that uh, um, there are first class and second class countries in terms of, of, of those capabilities that they have. However, it seems to me that we should speak about the nuclear weapons use possibility only in the theoretical and more the political manner, rather than in terms of the military manner, in terms of the Russian operation. Yes, it is still the question about rational against emotional, but at the same time, we need to understand that considering the reaction of many European politicians to the threat of the nuclear weapons and how it limits um, the provision of the help to Ukraine among some of them, uh, for Russia, it is much more beneficial to threat by it rather than use. Because as soon as you use the, uh, nuclear weapons, you don't have any other higher level threats and you, you don't have anything to make Europeans even more fear about the development of the situation, not speaking about Ukrainians. So in this way, it should be the final resolve or like the resolute decision of the Russian leadership to use the nuclear weapons because uh, after this, like the consequences will be unpredictable. There will be understanding that nothing more can be used in this warfare. So, uh, they will not be able to evaluate, um, the, uh, evolve the threat uh, rather than their gain with the threat. And as for now, we are really uh, witnessing the uh, their gain uh, with the threat. So uh, um, with this, with the current warfare, we definitely need to make few conclusions about the consequences of what, where we are now. And here I would say that um, the, the situation is extremely unstable as for now. First of all, we still see some countries that didn't comprehend that the security um, landscape changed. 
and that you cannot deal with the current situation with the approaches of 2015, let's say. The second is that there are still some countries that um, didn't understand how to uh, um, how to address uh, the current crisis. They are still thinking that telephone calls can uh, um, make another part to, to stop the war crimes, for example. So uh, uh, that is the situation when a lot of countries are still trying to uh, bargain their own national interests, sometimes very selfish interests, um, by the uh, um, lives of uh, people of the third countries. There are still quite a number of the politicians who didn't understand that it is not just about Ukraine, but about the European security in general, about the Black security in general, uh, because uh, what uh, um, the recent statements uh, from Moscow uh, are telling us that they are ready to threaten all others. They are ready to go further as soon as the situation with Ukraine will be uh, solved. Uh, then uh, uh, we are definitely need to talk about the uh, uh, return back from the soft security to the hard security, when we need to evaluate what our uh, our uh, military capabilities. And as these uh, uh, crisis demonstrated, that we have a lot of, of the Western European countries about whom we thought as about great powers, but it appeared that the state of their armed forces are much worse um, than. Um, expected and uh, uh, that they are just uh, can be not capable uh, to address the threats and they are definitely not capable to assist. And uh, the last but not the least, we definitely see the rise of the new uh, security players. We see the shift of the core or of the center of the decision making and the influence of the responsibility from Western uh, Europe to uh, um, northern eastern europe i would say it more like this so it's definitely now that uh, um poland uh, estonia lithuania latvia can have a stronger voice in terms of the uh, um, addressing security risks than uh, uh, portugal or, or france and uh, uh, definitely uh, we can see that with the possible admission of uh, finland and um, sweden we would have even more shift to the north from the west of Europe in this uh, regard. Because uh, uh, we already lost uh, the classical 19th, beginning of the 20th century notion of neutrality. When Switzerland is applying sanctions, when Sweden is providing military support, uh, it, it, it's not the same neutrality that we talked even during the Second World War. So uh, that's why it seems to me that, and that is my final word, the conclusion for this introduction, that we should be ready to all those difficult questions that are now being raised, that will take us probably a year or two of the uh, both academic, political, diplomatic discussions, and uh, that more and more questions would come that will uh, determine uh, the future of European security. So now these three months and even the next three months will not just give us the answers, but all these questions about neutrality, about leadership, about responsibility, about the capabilities, about accountability of the aggressor, all those questions we should be ready and open up to discuss. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Hannah. You've put a number of issues on the table. Um, of course, your focus is also very much focused on, on what is happening on the ground and the security implications. Well, we also know that uh, there are wider implications. Uh, today and tomorrow, the European Council is meeting. And if you look at the agenda of the European Council, there are four issues that are being discussed. Yes, energy that's dominating the, you know, the sixth energy package. But it's also Ukraine is an issue on the agenda. So is defense, European defense, which has been sped up as a consequence of, of, of the Russian invasion, um, as well as, as food security, which is also a consequence of that. And, and a number of other issues are, keep coming up as well, right? Uh, financing for reconstruction. I mean, and there are a number of consequences that are security related, but, uh, but also uh, uh, linked 
uh, that might sound secondary to security, but also very much linked to, to what is happening on the ground. So I, I will give the floor now to Hannes and, and uh, hear how he uh, uh, views the situation. And the reason I raised this issue, or yourself as, as a former parliamentarian also, there is that dimension as well, and those negotiations uh, that countries are involved in um, uh, to, to, to deal with the consequence of the war that maybe you want to sort of bring in into our discussion. Hannes. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dimitri. And uh, I agree with many things uh, Hannah said. And I'm very sad that uh, we cannot be in Odessa. Odessa for me has a special symbol of the not only because I have been often there, but if you study the history of Odessa, it's a European history with all the different influences, conflicts, even massacres, but at the end also the flourishing of a multicultural society. Now, um, on the Russian aggression, first of all, yes, uh, it is true that the Russian aggression, uh, that the Russian policy was uh, seen rational, but if you look at somebody who is irrational with a rational view, you will make a mistake. Uh, and mistakes have been made by many, not only in the, on the one side or the others, that we underestimated Putin's willingness, what I have called a revenge war, to start a revenge war against Ukraine, against the West, uh, whatever. We don't have to go into details now. There is no justification whatsoever. I, I, I deplore very much that in some countries, including my country, Germany, but also in other countries, we come to the US, especially with the intellectual, intellectual field, there are some people who say, well, yes, but Ukraine should have gone a different way, and Russia feels encircled and feels threatened by NATO expansion, as if all these elements could have uh, brought any justification to the Russian aggression, there is none, none whatsoever. Now, how to react? Well, in the US, uh, of course, we know uh, a very strong position, especially from the administration, but also in the intellectual, uh, recent uh, uh, prominent uh, expression of the other side was Mr. Kissinger, when he said, well, Ukraine should be patient and should give in and give some of the territory more or less to Russian or Russian control. So I think for the Americans very often, Ukraine, as many other countries, are just chess, pieces of the chessboard. You know, they should have a fight. They should do something. Of course, we deliver weapons. Uh, but this is true for the government side, but also from this intellectual side, say, let's have peace and give a compromise and whatever, uh, and uh, speak with the Russians and, and everything will be solved. And I think, uh, yes, the US has a stronger position now, but we should not trust too much the US, the one or the other side. Now in the European Union, you have, of course, this division, Sarah is right. Nevertheless, I would say we should really think a bit more with differentiation. First of all, Germany. Well, there's a German bashing, uh, but one has to see German was a very militarist country and started twice a war. The First World War, the Second World War. And everybody said to Germany, get rid of the, of the arms, be peaceful, go the way of economic development, of economic cooperation. It was not only Germany, but many other countries, even today, have some kind of relations with Russia, technological field, and so on. Uh, and it is difficult for, to say one country who has been trimmed and told all the time, get rid of this military mind you have in your heads, you know, in your Prussian heads, uh, all of a sudden to say, yes, we deliver weapons. Now, there is some change. There is a lot of change in Germany in relation, of course, much stronger than for many other countries, and it takes some time. Um, especially on the energy field. One should be realistic, what can be done. Of course, it would be good to stop any kind of, of gas transfer and oil transfer on oil. We have some progress at least. Uh, but if the public opinion is breaking down, it, it, it doesn't help. And we have also to see, if you see the Yugoslav wars, uh, the European Union failed totally. It did not intervene in any form. NATO at the end, did inter intervene, but especially also on the Kosovo case. But now the European Union changed already dramatically and helped Ukraine and will help Ukraine, also military, which is, you know, have been the non-go for, for some time. 
And I see what Hannah said, and I can uh, you know follow it. But we should not, and especially also Ukraine should not give the division now again as Mr. Rumsfeld at that time. There's a good Europe and the bad Europe. The good Europe is the Northern Europe, you know, which is supporting fully, and the bad Europe is the others who have some some doubts. This would not help to have a strong European Union behind Ukraine. Uh, and I think even if without Germany and German help, German economic support, the whole European Union would explode or implode. We should not forget that the European Union very much uh, with, uh, with the help and the whole enlargement issue very much was promoted by Germany, not by France, maybe by Britain, but Britain left anyway and had other interests. So I think it is what we got now one European Union, of course you have different, you saw it with the debate on the oil embargo, but at least this unity, and we should not from the outside say, you look, you are different, and there are the good people and the bad people. I don't think this is helping very much. We are going a new way in many respects, in the energy field, in the question of the defense policy and so on, so I think that that, that is absolutely necessary. And if we will have a positive answer to the EU aspiration of Ukraine, of Georgia, and Moldova, Moldova. then I think we need Germany. Uh, we need Germany, we need all the other countries, and I think that is absolutely necessary. Um, yeah, the telephone call, I don't know if they are useful. I don't think they are. I, I would share the criticism, you know, because it gives us a wrong impression. Nevertheless, in some way, the still big question, and also President Zelensky mentioned it, is, of course, how do we end the war? Uh, we all, not all maybe, but I would wish very much a crushing defeat of Russia. But it is different, you know, from Afghanistan, because it's always mentioned, yes, in Afghanistan, you had a defeat of Russia. Russia, Soviet Union at that time, Russia can be defeated. Yeah, it can be. But the question is, how will Putin react when he sees he will be defeated? And we don't see it really now. So the question is how to find the moment when you have some sort of a peace solution, but at the same time also defeat of Russia and Russian influence and Russian decision to invade. I think there's a very difficult way to find what I fear with all those like uh, Mr. Kissinger who uh, do some pressure on, on quick talks, that we will have a so-called solution, a very fragile situation where we will have conflicts and conflicts again and again. So the most difficult thing now is to have an end of the war, not now because it's too early, uh, even if many people are still killed, especially Ukrainians, unfortunately, but to have an end of the war which is going into a new phase of OEC, mandate, whatever, but with a strong mandate. If we have the same situation again as we had before the war, killings going on, very fragile situation, Russia's always intermingling into Ukraine affairs because of their occupation, it does not help. So I'm rather on the side of those who say we have to, to continue the war until Russia is in, in some way defeated, not defeated in the sense as Germany was defeated after the Second World War, but which is a, obviously a defeat for Russian intention and invasion, but nevertheless to have this small window of opportunity when you can stop uh, the war where many people are killed and victims. But this is a very difficult path, and of course Ukraine has to decide for itself, but also European Union and, and, and the US. And I think what we need, and with this I will stop because there are many other issues, what we really need a united Europe and not a division from the inside and from the outside. Um, and uh, yes, pressure of course is necessary, understandable. I know that Ukrainians cannot be satisfied as long as the war is going on. But we should be very careful to have the basis for a new Europe with Ukraine, which is not built on hatred or on new divisions inside Europe, but which is contributing to the unity of the European Union, because that's the only way we can meet the Russian challenge, because the Russian challenge will not be over with that war. I think the Russian challenge will be here for 
for many years to come, unfortunately. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Hannes. Uh, you've you've raised a, a, a number of issues, and one is very interesting: the, the comparison to two thousand and three, uh, and you know, either you're with us or you're against us, which is a dividing line that Europeans were forced. And the context is different, but it's interesting. Uh, you know, you you mentioned Donald Rumsfeld uh, between countries that supported the U.S. invasion of Iraq and those that did not. But irrespective of that, it created dividing lines within Europe. And then your point about finding the right balance, uh, which is, as you said, uh, trying to find some sort of solution uh, to, leading to peace, but also uh, where Russia is defeated um, uh, to a certain extent where it's able to sit at the table to, to, to negotiate, um, but we're not quite there yet, right? We're not quite there yet. And this is a, a part of the issue right now. How long can this war go on? And, and, and the need for, for European unity in particular, uh, not only during this uh, this war, during this invasion, but also afterwards, uh, in order to meet the challenge. I mean, we still have to build the security architecture, and Russia is is there. It's going to be our neighbor for for a long time. Um, so let me uh, pass on, uh, give the floor now to, to James Rogers. Uh, you've heard the two uh, previous speakers, Hannah and Hannes, uh, and and their perspectives that are. Uh, different, uh, yet uh, very similar. Uh, and I, I think also it's very interesting, as I was thinking, all of us have been involved in this sort of work, you know, which is uh, dialogue, peace, uh, conflict resolution. It's so difficult right now for many of us, where our instinct is to bring parties together to, to actually suggest that we are at a position to do this, given the consequences, given the war crimes, given the brutality of, of the attack, and given the fact that it's much more than just a, a, uh, an, an invasion of a country of Ukraine with wider security implications and consequences for Europe. So, James, floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Sarah. It's very good to be with you. And I think the point that you've just made is perhaps um, reflective or indicative of the fact that we are moving away from the world of the 1990s and we're moving into a very different age where competition and geopolitical struggle um, will be central to um, the way in which we view the world and therefore we have to adapt uh, accordingly. So it might not be the case that we need to simply bring people together but, prevent, but rather we need to help other people to prevail and to provide them with all the military and financial resources that they require in order to achieve that. Um, I thought I'd divide my brief presentation into two um, sections. Now, the question was, what are the consequences of the Russian reinvasion, we should say, or renewed offensive um, against uh, Ukraine? Now, of course, as Hannah said earlier, this is a very dynamic environment and it's very difficult to you know, open a crystal ball and to try and predict what might or might, might not happen. But I think there are a few things that have become immediately apparent that will help us to move forward and to understand the consequences of, of this conflict and of Russia's uh, intentions. The first one, I think, is that it does actually and absolutely confirm um, the, mil the malicious nature um, and intentions of Russia's uh, kleptocracy. It confirms the regime will do almost anything it needs to do in order to survive um, and to preserve itself. And it's, its eyes, I think, very firmly uh, set on that. It will do anything required to survive. And it saw, I think, the transition of Ukraine over recent years towards um, the Euro-Atlantic structures as being part of that. Um, and it's uh, lashing out um, in the way that it currently is in order to prevent the Russian people from seeking the same kind of transition, the same kind of political changes that Ukraine has gone through um, in, in the future. I think Russia's approach has been confirmed as being thoroughly anti-systemic. It's a spoiler power and it will use anything at its disposal, including energy, um, in order to achieve its objectives. Its approach is also, I think, non-linear. The longer that conflict goes on, the better it is for Russia and particularly for Russia's um, regime. Um, and that means that Russia doesn't actually want an end to this conflict. It wants it to go on and on and on because it means that Ukraine will be destabilized and unable to determine its own future in the way that Ukraine should be able, uh, should be able of course, uh, to do. So any attempt by certain European countries to um, provide some kind of negotiated settlement that particularly the Ukrainians are not prepared to accept, I think will lead to failure and will ultimately empower the Russian kleptocracy in the Kremlin. And also I think it confirms Russia's internal rot 
and military weakness in many respects. I think many analysts thought that Russia would do far better than it initially did. And I think its initial failures, whether that's the seizure of Kiev um, or the more general armed assault on northern uh, Ukraine, has not, has not succeeded in the way that Russia or many Western analysts anticipated. So it's very clear, I think, that Russia is not the military superpower that many initially thought it was, and we should be prepared to adapt our policies, particularly in Europe, um, uh, accordingly. It is not the military superpower that many thought it actually was. Secondly, I think, and I think this was actually lacking in some quarters, particularly in Europe, but also in the United States and Canada, um, I think it affirms the conflict, the, the Russian um, offensive or renewed offensive against Ukraine confirms or affirms the sovereignty of Ukraine um, in the sense that you, the Ukrainian nation is willing to fight for its right to determine its own affairs in the world. Um, if Ukraine prevails in this war, and I very much of course hope it does, uh, Ukraine will strengthen, I think, its role in European security. And I think a big question is going to be uh, looming over the horizon for the EU. Um, how could it reject a Ukrainian membership, even if that membership bid might take some time, given what Ukraine has gone through and what Ukraine has done to resist um, the Russian uh, aggressor? I also think, in, in, in re regard to those two points, that the um, Russian uh, renewed offensive against Ukraine actually reveals the poverty of the German and French approach towards Russia and European security more generally. I think it's the case that France and Germany have both lost, for different reasons, much prestige in recent months. Their assessment of Russia has been fundamentally flawed. Their energy policy, particularly Germany's energy policy, has been fundamentally flawed and has actively, I think, contributed to helping Russia uh, to get back on its feet after the tumultuous years of the 1990s and 2000s. After all, um, the EU has uh, paid Russia over one trillion uh, US dollars between 2009 and 2019 for energy, money which of course has found its way directly into the coffers of the Russian state, which have provided the resources to modernize Russia's military um, and to lash out at surrounding countries. I think the Minsk and Normandy formats have been shown to be fundamentally flawed. I think the Germans and French have revealed a lack of European solidarity in standing with their Eastern and Central European uh, partners and allies. And I think it's reflected in the way in which there is now some kind of transition, both of power and of debate in Germany, perhaps a bit less in France, um, about um, European security more generally. And finally, I think it actually kind of counterintuitively confirms NATO's ability to deter um, and it confirms the rationale for countries like Ukraine and Georgia and Moldova, if they want to, to join um, NATO and the protection that it affords. After all, Ukraine is not lashing out against a NATO ally, whether it's in northeastern Europe or northern Europe, it's actually lashing out against uh, Ukraine. So those, I think, are the immediate consequences of this conflict. Now, there are some more long-term ones, I think, um, and I'll just come to those. I think, as Hannah said, um, it will actually shift the balance of power away from Western and Central Europe towards Eastern and Northern Europe. Um, not only have many of the countries in that region been more accurate in their strategic assessment of Russia, um, but I think they're going to become increasingly unwilling to live under the guise of French and German leadership of the European Union and the European approach um, more generally. I think they've come to see Ukraine as a fellow European country which has experienced many of the same things that they once experienced, and therefore, they're much more determined to see that the European approach towards Ukraine um, change and change fundamentally and over the longer term, not just in the immediate here and now. I think we're seeing Poland emerging as a new center of strategic gravity within this new um, Eastern and Northern European uh, center of uh, flank of, of, of both Europe and, and NATO. And I think in turn, that will strengthen the European Union in a way um, insofar as it will come under a different form of influence and uh, leadership. But at the same time, I think it also simultaneously will strengthen uh, Atlanticism and the uh, NATO alliance, not least because, of course, Finland and Sweden have turned to NATO in recent months after many years of deliberation and debate. Um, in that sense, it reveals the in inadequacy, I think, of the EU's Article 42.7, the so-called Mutual Defence Clause, and it emphasises the strategic primacy of both NATO and um, Atlanticism. Beyond that, I think the longer term strategic comp consequences will be to reconfirm the absolute centrality of both the United Kingdom and the United States to the defense of Europe. For all the talk of a sovereign Europe or of European strategic autonomy, the countries that most push that um, narrative have been found, as we've already discovered, rather wanting. 
Now, you might say that the UK and US um, should have provided even more support for Ukraine in its hour of need, but perhaps we need to think about this a little counterfactually. What would have happened if they had not taken the decisions that they had taken since late 2021 in terms of the provision of intelligence um, or the release of intelligence, the provision of weapons and, of course, um, direct um, political support? More generally, their strategic, obsess their strategic assessment of Russia and its intentions was spot on, even though it flew in the face of some assessments of other continental European countries. And they also seem, uh, appear, or they seem set to, to want Ukraine to prevail and Putin to fail, much like their Eastern and Northern, Euro Northern European um, partners um, and allies. Now, if we look at the simple amount of support that they provided Ukraine, it stands way above anything that um, any other European country has um, provided. The US has now provided almost more support than all of the countries of the European Union put together. And the UK is, although quite so by some distance, um, the second largest provider of assistance. Um, and it actually has provided more military uh, support than both France and Germany uh, combined. In that sense, I think the UK has played a specific role in this conflict, um, and that is it has really pushed itself forward um, to show that irrespective of Brexit, which was given a lot of discussion a few years ago, it still is and, and, and is deeply committed to European uh, security. Its assessment of Russia was the most accurate among any of the large European powers. It was also the first to use its intelligence offensively to reveal what Russia was intending to do. It was the first, of course, to ship missiles to Ukraine and the first to begin reshaping the multilateral structures of Europe through the Joint Expeditionary Force, the trilateral with Ukraine and Poland, and the security assurances that is provided to both Finland and Sweden. And I think in this sense, what we'll see going forward is that Ukraine, alongside Poland, will become key partners for the UK in this new um, emerging European security environment. And then finally, I think the longest strategic implication of the war, in, the war against Ukraine, Russia's war against Ukraine, will be that it will emphasize the indivisibility of the Euro-Atlantic and the Indo-Pacific regions, given that there has been so much focus in recent years in the US, in the UK, and to some extent in France, um, on the Indo-Pacific. After all, both the British and Japanese Prime Ministers on meeting a couple of months ago uh, described the security of the two regions as being utterly indivisible. And this shows, I think, how far strategic perceptions have shifted both in the Indo-Pacific and the Euro-Atlantic and how the two theatres have folded into one another. And I think in, in time, this is likely to have significant structural implications for both the British and American geostrategic postures, both in Europe and more globally. Um, and, and that is something that we should pay great attention to because in no small way that's going to shape um, the, the geopolitics, I think, of, um, of the future. Um, thank, thank you, James. Um, you've added new elements sort of to this discussion and debate. Um, I am not sure I, I totally agree with you on all of these things. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a European federalist, and it's interesting in federalist circles when we talk, we actually think that uh, Europe is, is actually it's a chance for Europe to be strengthened, very much like Hannes sort of mentioned. And on a number of issues, um, and I also see the chat about strategic autonomy and so on being dead. Uh, I, I think we have to wait and see. I think it's it's not dead. Uh, I think it's being built. And and the interesting thing about having a, a focus only on um, Poland and the Baltic states and a few countries taking the lead for European security, well, the question then comes, you know, France and Germany are relevant because that's where the money is also. And, and so there, there's, there's a financial implication which we have to consider as we're building Europe. There are financial, financial implications regarding enlargement, there are financial implications regarding everything uh, at this stage. So I'm not so sure how this... Uh, uh, I mean, yes, uh, I, I can see the UK, Poland... Uh, Ukraine access developing and fundamental for European security, but it cannot be the only one. Uh, but anyway, the, I think a number of issues have been raised by all three of you. But before I give the floor uh, to the to, to to our participants that have been active on chat, maybe some of you want to respond to each other. Can I start with you, Hannah? Yes, um, if you were, I, I even don't know responses or the questions to to what Hans uh, um, uh, said. Uh, you know, he had been comparing the situation to Afghanistan, and there are several questions that raised in my mind. First of all, can we allow ourselves to wait for 10 years for the Russia defeat? I'm not sure. We are not in the same conditions anymore, and the war is different. The second is that the war in Afghanistan for the Soviet Union was a war of geopolitics. 
So they could allow this, themselves a slow war and the certain actions that, for example, now Russians already lost more soldiers in Ukraine than they lost for the 10 years in Afghanistan. It is a different type of the war because the current war is not war of geopolitics. It is the existential war, at least from the Ukrainian point of view. But also if you follow all the latest statements of uh, Mr. Putin, Mr. Medvedev and uh, Patrushev and all other leadership, they are not talking about geopolitics. They are talking about existing of the Ukrainian nation. So this war is a little bit different. So the wins, the victories and the losses are different and the goals are different. So in this way, it seems to me that waiting for 10 years, how many more Bucha, Irpenia, Mariupol can you allow at the territory of Ukraine? And definitely we already with much more sophisticated weapons that we had in the 1980s. So the results of the shelling, the devastating results of the shelling of the residential areas are much more um, difficult and tragic than uh, uh, what we saw during the uh, different uh, um, actions uh, at the territory of Afghanistan when we speak about 1980s. I'm not comparing with any developments that been later, just about the Soviet um, involvement. And because of this, I'm definitely coming to the question that I receive this question all the time, what is the victory for Ukraine? Because if it is the victory for Ukraine, somebody thinking that is defeat for Russia. Somehow, especially before February, Ukrainians didn't care about Russia. That was their problem, that they have problems with the human rights, that they have almost dictator in power, that they have all these limitations. That was their country and their problem. So as for now, what does mean defeat? How you define what is the level of acceptable or not acceptable defeat? Because when we hear a lot of uh, times these conversations, they are always very theoretical. Nobody is proposing what they consider as possible or not possible. What does it mean saving face of Mr. Putin? Meaning that he's in power? Okay, we don't care as soon as the Russian population is okay with this. Or say uh, uh, not a full defeat means that we need to give him part of the Ukrainian territory. Why should we do it? Why many of the European politicians are ready to trade off Ukrainian interest to find some kind of the compromise with the Russian Federation? but not trading off anything from the Russian uh, interest. Because let's be honest, all those conversations and negotiations that we had in November, December, January, they were about what Ukraine should give up. Nobody was talking what Russia should do in this situation. Nobody was saying that it's Russia who should change and somehow their policy. Everybody was thinking, um, yes, to have the Western or NATO Russian uh, a good relations, should we make Crimea be in Russian territory and agree to this? Or maybe should we agree that Ukraine would not be a member of NATO? So all their compromises being asked from Ukraine. And in this way, I can't understand why independent um, Ukrainian sovereign state being one of the biggest by territory and by the number of population in Europe should be a compromise between Berlin and Moscow, Washington and Moscow, I don't know, Rome and Moscow. Why somebody is deciding it for us? Or when some French or Italian journalists are asking me, why Ukraine don't want to give some territory to Russia so they would be happy? Okay, they already got uh, uh, Crimea in 2014. Did it make them happy? Or they wanted more? Or they occupied now the territory? It was uh, today or yesterday, a wonderful um, post online when somebody put the territory occupied currently by Russia and put it to the territory of the other European countries. Sorry, they occupied now half of Italy. So what is next? What they want next? They want my city. Just today I had two air raids. I did something for Moscow or I should decide that because Odessa had some uh, historical contacts with Catherine the Great Empress, I should become a Russian citizen or something like this. So honestly, it's not emotional now from my side. It became very, very practical and political why we are trading off Ukrainian interest to calm down or as somebody is hoping to calm down Russia. But we are not asking any changes from Russian policies. What changes you're asking? That Russia will uh, get out from our territory. That is their obligation. That is not a compromise from their side. It is something like you're negotiating with a rapist or probably you will not rape her daily, but only once per week. And in this case, we can compromise and she will stay with you. Or with the domestic violence, you have telling it to the husband. We are definitely not in the same conditions. We are not back in 2014. 
We are not even back in 2021. We are now in 2022 when we already have more than 30,000 Ukrainian civilians being killed. Just listen to this number, 30,000 civilians. When you had 70% of the cities like Kharkiv being completely destroyed. And you're absolutely okay and you're not forgetting the geographical center of Europe is in Ukraine. So that it seems to me that is quite immoral now to speak about the compromises with Russia um, by Ukraine. I mean, taking something from Ukraine in this case. At least, okay, if you're not uh, disagree with sanctions, we can be perfect with this. But propose any alternatives. What you're asking from Moscow, what changes you're asking from Moscow, what Moscow should do in this situation. Why everybody is talking only what Ukraine should do and to compromise just to get out uh, the Russian forces from our territory. Thank you, Hannah. You, you know, I, I mean, there's one more dimension which we're not talking about here. It's not really about Russia, what Russia should do for European leaders. And maybe Hannah is going to address this. It's also about their own public opinions and how, uh, uh, you know, democratic governments, uh, pro-European governments, uh, those committed to defense uh, will survive and not fall prey to populists because of the consequences. I think the debate is not just about Russia per se. I think it's, it's deeper in European societies. And I think this is what... I would think some of the leaders would have to balance out. But anyway, uh, Hannes, uh, you you have wanted to add something? Yes. Uh, first of all, uh, to, to Hannah, I think there was a misunderstanding with Afghanistan. Uh, when people say, well, Russia never will be defeated, and some people say, well, in Afghanistan they were defeated. So it does not compare the two wars. It only underlines the fact that Russia can be defeated. If it will be defeated in that, uh, now in Ukraine, in what kind, of course, is a different issue. I fully agree with, uh, with Hannah on these uh, immoral advices. You should do that, you should that, and you should get up some of the country. There's no, no debate about that. Uh, I, I fully agree. Uh, of course, let's be honest. The fact is that there will be have to be some solution. I don't know which one, and I don't give any advice because that that's the immoral thing is to give an advice. But it's up to at the end to Zelensky and the people in Ukraine to discuss with others. Because even the UK and when we come to James, it's good that we have James because I disagree with many points on it. Even James uh, will not say, "Yeah, UK is going into the war with Russia." And the U.S. is not going into the war with Russia. So uh, it, it's done, you know, the EU is doing nothing, but the U.S. and the U.K. is going into war. No, they don't go. And they will refrain from it to go into the war with Russia. This effect. Uh, now, coming to, to the other issue, I think uh, uh, if the U.K. would have been so much interested in European security, they should not have left the European Union. They should even have strengthened the European Union. There was once between Tony Blair and uh, I don't know who was president then, was Chirac, I think uh, an agreement on building defense capacity and strengthening defense alliance. But the UK didn't want, the UK want to be alone. So I think uh, they are not very interested on, on European defense. Now, Mr. Johnson sees a chance to get back on the world stage. He can be very happy about the war because now he can show his strengths and go into Ukraine and, and be the strong man. Secondly, well, I think uh, Dimitri already mentioned it. The whole European enlargement was a big security step forward, and it would not have been taken, would not have been possible without Germany. And even France, even if France was not uh, on the lead of unfortunate blocking, but we need also to fight Russia in the Western Balkans, where it is uh, also active. So yes, of course, it's a different war, the war in Ukraine and the, the fight we have to do with Russia on, on the Western Balkans. And I think we should continue the enlargement, also including, of course, uh, Ukraine. But uh, uh, nevertheless, there are already some countries waiting and uh, the EU has to, to support it. So I think uh, it is a bit naive and a bit, um, you know, uh, arrogant, I would even say, from uh, some in the US and some in the UK to, to look down on, on Europe as if they had, to, had done nothing for security, nothing for helping the Eastern European countries. And then again, 
you know, the big money is not coming from the Baltic countries. And of course, money is not all. But money also, with money, you need to buy arms because you, you will not be presented uh, arms as a gift. So, um, yes, uh, UK may have an interest to split the European Union when they left uh, in order to show that it was okay and the right to leave. But I think what we need is a stronger European Union. We should work on the strengths. Yes, it is true that some of the Eastern European countries, not Eastern Europe, if you look to Slovakia, of course, the government, yes, people are very hesitant, uh, also in some other countries. But countries, I would say, especially countries who have, bad, have made a bad experience with Russia or the Soviet Union in the past, Romania especially, Poland, and of course the Baltic countries, they are more sensitive on this issue. And in Finland, it needed also some time. You know, Finland was very strong on, on good cooperation with Russia. So only recently they, they, they changed the mood when they saw what, what Russia is really doing. And I can remember a UK which was very good for the, for the um, oligarchs, very receptive, very friendly to all the oligarchs in, in London. So we should not, you know, go back again to this issue. These are bad and these are good. And uh, if, if UK wants to help, on this issue, they should uh, align themselves. They will not, of course, join the European Union. I know that, and I'm very. Uh, well, it was very sad when they left because they have very great sympathy for the UK and the UK people. But then there should be a strong cooperation, not as some sort of a division again. The good Europeans and the bad. I think the Europeans, neither the Germans nor the French, need lectures. Uh, yes, there has to be some change and some some different attitudes. But I think without Germany and, and, and France and Italy and Spain uh, and many other countries, uh, Poland and the Baltics will not succeed in building the new defense uh, unity. And of course, what I also have to say, as Democrats, as people fighting against autocracy, we support Poland in its policies concerning uh, now, of course, helping the, the Ukrainians. But everybody says, it's not the Polish government, it's very much the Polish citizens who are helping the refugees. And um, we cannot forget the autocratic, undemocratic developments in Poland, even if there are small compromises now. So um, yes, uh, European Union is not only a security union, it's also a union, a union of human rights, of civil rights. And that includes, of course, Ukraine, because we want to have Ukraine because they long for the same kind of human rights and civil rights as the principles of the European Union. So, yes, I have, there's some different opinions. That's good for a debate. Uh, but I think um, uh, I want to defend a European Union which has many mistakes, but which made also great step forward in the past uh, decades in unifying the, 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 the continent. And the final and basic fight will be between the European Union and Russia on the same continent. We have to live on the same continent and we have to find the right balance between fighting Mr. Putin and his oligarchs and his entourage, and but not fighting the Russians. Uh, this is another debate, of course, we have to, to find because hate, hate is not a basis for European cooperation. Um, that I, I can understand that many people in Ukraine have developed that kind of hate. But it must be hated against Putin. It must be hatred against the oligarchs and all those who are, you know, like uh, the head of the Orthodox Church. These are the guys we have to fight against. Um, thank you, thank you, Hannes. Before I give the floor to James to for his comments, let me also uh, because there are a couple of questions. One is addressed to Hannah, but we'll get to Hannah in a second. But James, one is a more general one, so let me just read it out. So it's from Stanislav uh, Zelikovsky. Um, the question is, how do you think Kiev and the international community should act if Moscow declares annexation of new regions uh, of Ukraine, like the Crimean scenario, and Putin's threats that an attack on these territories will be equal to an attack on Russia? Uh, thank you. And, and linked to this, I mean, I was reading today, I think it was in the Washington Post, a story how, at least in the East, uh, the Russian troops seem to be making some progress right now. And part of the issue has to do whether they're going to be consolidating in parts of, of Donbass. So this 
this sort of ties into this question. So you go ahead, you can comment on the discussion and maybe even uh, try to answer the question that we just, uh, that was just asked. Go ahead, James. Okay, I just wanted to make a few points, um, which I, I have been brought up in, in the last sort of round of discussion. Um, I think firstly, the point I'd like to make, and this comes back to my initial point, I, I don't think you know, that a strong UK or US and UK US role in Europe is mutually exclusive to that of a strong EU. The British Prime Minister, for all of the things we heard a few moments ago, actually has stated that he wants the UK to act, act as a buttress to the EU, not to try and weaken it or divide it. Um, I think the question here is whose vision of the EU prevails? Is it the sort of French or German vision of the EU, which seems to be prepared to surrender Ukraine um, or, or so to, to give away parts of Ukraine to other people? Um, or, or is it that that provides Ukraine with all the resources that it requires, so long as Ukraine wants to fight, to actually um, throw the Russian aggressor out of Ukraine in the way that I think Hannah suggested a moment ago? And that, I think, is a fundamental issue. And there is a divide in Europe as to which of those visions um, prevails. And that, that divide has existed all the way back since 2014. And we saw it, of course, with the Minsk and Normandy formats and processes, which led absolutely nowhere and may have even assisted Ukraine, Russia and the Putin regime in its, um, its offensive against, against that country. So I think that's a really important um, point. Uh, the second point I'd like to just raise very briefly is that on European defence and strategic autonomy. Now, I mean, let's be very clear here. You know, the, the UK started leaving the, the European Union now seven years ago in 2016, but I haven't actually seen a great deal of movement in terms of uh, European defence or strategic autonomy. I haven't really seen significant increases in defence spending in either France or until recently Germany, um, to say nothing of many other countries like Spain and Italy. But I have seen significant increases in defence spending in countries like the Baltic states, in Poland, in Romania, and even in the Nordic states. So I think this is something that needs to be given some consideration. You know, if you're going to advocate for specific policies, you need to put your money where your mouth is, because it's only with that money that the that, that change will be, um, will be made. And in that regard, countries like the UK and the US do spend a significant amount of their GDP on defence. And that is why they have um, militaries which have global um, focus and militaries which are, I think, trusted by other European uh, allies. Now, to come to this specific question, I think that Stanislav um, asked, I mean, I, I think the issue here is, well, we do what or we should do what Ukraine, the Ukrainian government wants to do. So if Ukraine um, wants to continue to fight, to throw the Russians out of any areas that they might seek to annex, then we should provide the military and economic resources to do that. And that doesn't mean that we're going to head into a war with Russia. I think, frankly, that's a bit of gaslighting. Um, you know, we can be in a strategic competition with Russia, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to go to war with it. It does mean, however, that we can provide other countries, in this case Ukraine, with the means that they require in order to um, succeed in their objectives. And that's very, very different to going to war with Russia. And, and there are, I think, various incentives we have, including deterrence, that will prevent that from happening. And those, of course, require further consideration. But nonetheless, this does not automatically mean that we're going to go to war with Russia, and that should not be used as an excuse to prevent or not provide Ukraine with the resources that it requires in order to prevail in this um, conflict. So in that case, I think if the Russians annex the territories or annex further territories in Ukraine, we should not recognize them if that is what the Ukrainian government wishes. And then we should provide additional resources to the Ukrainian government in order to throw the Russians out of those territories and take them back again. And this is, after all, Ukraine's fight in the same way that Britain's fight in the past uh, against uh, expansionist tyranny on the continent had to be uh, undertaken in order for there to be a free and democratic uh, Europe. So I think those are the issues at hand and those are the ones that need to be given further consideration. Thank you, James. Um, uh, Hannah, back to you. I mean, yeah, you, you can see the chat, but, but let me just read out the one question specifically, right? A couple of questions from uh, Marilia Husha. Says, um, so, yeah, you said, Hannah, you said that Russia should compromise. Can you maybe make a suggestion on how? Also, considering that Russia has some considerable leverages vis-a-vis -vis Europe, uh, mostly on energy. We've seen what's been happening in the European Council yesterday and today. Do you think that Europe will be able to completely or be willing to completely forego any sort of negotiation with Russia? You know, first of all, about energy, the price we are paying now, it is, uh, um, it, it's so high because we were reluctant to pay it earlier when it was uh, much cheaper. Uh, for many years, we've been talking about the uh, Nord Stream 2, for example, as the strategic uh, mistake. 
and uh, uh, now all those losses that we have are exactly because uh, uh, some of the European countries didn't want to diversify their energy, both in terms of the sources um, and in terms of the uh, uh, green energy. And they were absolutely okay. The question is that Ukraine saw it in 2014. It's not because we were anti-Russian these eight years, but because in 2014 we had the same problem. Those enterprises that um, modernized themselves and used less Russian energy, they were okay with the problems and the Russian uh, use of uh, gas and weapon. Those who were okay with the cheap prices, they became very much dependent, both economically and politically, from the Russian Federation. But uh, we've been one of the biggest uh, buyers of consumers of the Russian gas. And for the last eight years, we managed to find other sources. We've been trying to diversify, not that successful as many of our energy experts would like to see it, but still we managed. And the same with electricity. We were lucky and we are lucky now that just two days before the invasion, we managed to um, switch off from the Russian system or let's say Soviet system of uh, electricity to the European system. So that is definitely the question that we had these eight years of talking about other sources of energy that we can have. But at the same time, they were nice prices. And uh, the logic, for example, what I heard from some of the German politicians uh, within this month says why they don't want to stop buying Russian uh, um, gas. Um, it would be better we buy with the prices, cheaper prices that we have now, that Russia would sell it to others like China for the higher prices and would get the uh, uh, higher income. Honestly, the EU consider this as the normal argument that you're not stopping buying Russian uh, uh, gas, <clears throat> not because of the, um, I mean, some high prices for you, but because you're afraid Russia will sell it somebody else with the higher prices. I mean, that's clearly demonstrating a uh, misunderstanding that energy being used by the Russian Federation as a weapon. It's been used since 2004 when we had the first energy and gas crisis. However, everybody thought that it would never touch them, that that is probably just Russian-Ukrainian uh, um, problems because we cannot negotiate some old uh, um, disputes. Uh, the same Moldova is having uh, the, the last years and how gas and energy is used by the Russian Federation to uh, push and to pressure in some of the issues. So that is definitely we need to be aware of that it's not that the countries cannot survive without Russia energy. That is the question that nobody wants to really strategically think about how to survive without Russian energy, or at least how to make the certain check and balances. For example, when we've been talking about unbidling, that uh, the owners of the pipes should not be the same as owners of the uh, sources. And uh, that's what Gazprom been lobbying intentionally and intensively in Europe. Uh, trying to avoid the European norms. When we speak about the um, uh, compromises, it's definitely not what we are talking now, because now we are talking about Russia just being back to the norms of international law and um, uh, normal situation. But uh, uh, why nobody talked about, for example, Russian Federation getting out of Donbass or demilitarizing uh, Kaliningrad? Uh, or changing, uh, stopping militarizing Crimea when the Russians been bringing 38 times more caliber missiles than it used um, to be before 2014. Or why nobody insisted to the serious negotiations about arms control or the open sky and many others. It was easier to speak that the only threat it is uh, Ukrainian desire to become a NATO member state. So it's been like uh, NATO is the threat for Russia. But any types of the Russian attempts to militarize and even nuclearize Crimea, it was absolutely okay for the NATO member state. I understand from where it is coming. It is coming that even back to, uh, 10 years ago in 2010, the NATO strategic council were saying that Russia is strategic partner. And NATO was not ready to perceive uh, Russia as any type of the danger or the threat because they were open for the collaborative approach towards these threats and risks. But it was the wonderful miscalculation because uh, the same year the Russian documents were saying that NATO is a threat. And this misperception of each other brought us to the situation of 2014. So it seems to me that now we are just like a firefighters instead of trying to make the uh, um, 
uh, certain actions before this, how to prevent it. So nobody been caring about the inflammable substances. Yeah, everybody is now caring just about the uh, firefighting. But it seems to me that this firefighting is happening by the different, um, better say, by the wrong instruments. Uh, because uh, you are, uh, with what you are doing, you can just promote, provoke um, the bigger desires and wishes from the Russian Federation. Because if they understand that they can get something by the military means, nothing would stop them further. Because if they understand that this type of bullying of Europe, of NATO, is working, why they should change uh, their methods? Why they should uh, choose other ways of uh, uh, playing? But also, let's be honest, that we already see that some other countries are looking to how successful can be uh, the Russian actions. Can they act the same within uh, uh, the United Nations? Can they act the same in uh, Asia Pacific? Can they act the same in other regions? And that, unfortunately, will have quite a long term consequences for many other regions. Yeah, th thanks, Hannah. I mean, not, not only Asia Pacific region, even in Europe, can they act the same? I mean, <laughs> uh, my country is, uh, is is experiencing quite a bit of that. Um, uh, anyway, we can see. I mean, you know, I, I, I keep thinking the dilemma is. I mean, you raised something, Hannah, before you, and you said it, right now. So what is thirty thousand Ukrainians have lost their lives, and that number is growing, and that's the reality of the war. We have cities destroyed, obviously. One of the things we have to look into because of, you know, of this, of, of the values, I mean, because I, I, Hannah and I were in a meeting in Istanbul a few days ago, and, and we talked in this workshop, and I raised the issue of, of how we are back to some sort of Poles or block mentality, where the West is united on a variety of fronts, but there is a, there's a normative framework underlying it, and it means that part of the solution would also mean some sort of, you know, Nuremberg-like trials or whatever at the end. I mean, for what is happening in Ukraine, 30,000 plus lives being lost today. And we have the destruction, the utter destruction uh, of, of cities, human rights, uh, war crimes being committed. And so we have to consider that dimension as well. But on the one hand, we have that issue, the issue of the reality on the ground, the brutality of the attack, and trying to find a way forward. And, you know, as you were talking, I was just looking at the European Council conclusions very quickly. And again, uh, for all the maligning one might do to different countries and how some are with the war effort, some are less or more reticent, um, looking at these Council conclusions, just like the ones that have come uh, over the course of, of this year, the last few months since the Russian invasion began, um, uh, Europe is speeding up its attempts uh, at uh, tremendously uh, with results being gained, whether it's on the energy front, whether it's on the food security front, whether it's on the defense front, things that have been there for a while, but they're actually speeding up in trying to move forward. I even see references to Article 42.7 that James mentioned uh, in the defense part of the, the conclusions. And, and I'm sure that next month at the next European Council, again, we will have many more things out there, uh, which is unheard of. And I think the divisions uh, and the differences between the countries uh, is telling and it's pushing this process forward. Just like, I mean, even the German debate. I mean, I've been reading a lot and I think that the part of the, re I mean, I understand how Hannes has been putting forth the issue as to how it's very difficult for the German, Germany to change. It's slowly moving. But uh, there's a dimension also, which is public opinion, which is also pushing the government to start changing, right? Because of the war crimes and other things being committed, right? And that's how that's also having an impact uh, on, on Germany moving forward and other societies moving forward. Um, and, and just like it's had an impact on, on, you know, Finland and Sweden, and I'm sure, Hannes, also in your country, there is a debate regarding uh, whether you maintain neutrality or you need something else for your security, right? I mean, it's the government has not put it there officially, but I, I, from what I understand, this is also happening uh, in Austria, which is unheard of, if you one would think. Um, anyway, we've come to the end uh, of, uh, I mean, we've, it's 7.15, but I want to maybe give one minute each to each one of you. I know, Hannes, you have a point to, you want to make to the speakers uh, before we close. Um, Hannes, go ahead. Yeah, very, very briefly. First, I think we should not say that Germany and France wants uh, Ukraine to surrender. What is true, and this is also in the chat, 
is that some people say, well, uh, Russia should be defeated, and others say Russia should not win. And of course, there's a difference. And that, that, that's true. Let's be honest. Secondly, on the European strategic autonomy, I don't think this, this is a crazy idea to think about strategic autonomy if you don't have really nuclear weapons. And, and that, unfortunately, is the case. And if you have weak defense, it's not the defense spending, and it's not even the number of, of, of arms and of people under arms, which is bigger, much bigger than in Russia, in Europe. But it's the efficiency. The efficiency because it's so divided between different countries. But think about it, and Dimit, you mentioned if we would really have no European Union, every country would be similar. Do you think that Poland would, would really go into supporting Ukraine as it does it now? Uh, it's only because Poland is part of a European community and can count on the money coming from Germany and other countries that this is happening. On the Minsk format, because it was mentioned by James, yeah, I agree. It, it, it was not good, but it was done also with the, with, with the uh, willingness and support of the Ukrainians themselves. Um, it was a try, and I understand that Ukraine did not fulfill it because also Russia did not fulfill it. And of course, it is at the end, from behind side, it was a mistake. On energy, the argument which uh, told uh, was told to Hannah, of course, is crazy. But the real question is another one. Let's be very honest. If we stop the gas import for some countries, it's an economic disaster. And that would, of course, change very much the mind of the citizens and the opinion. Now you can say, what is some 100,000 more or millions more of unemployed against people, 100,000 people of death? Yes, but we're still in different countries. And, and this is a fact of life. It should be very open and frank. And, and it's only because it would be an economic disaster. It would be many, many unemployed people in Germany, in Austria, in some other country. This is a, the effect. But what we will do is to phase out very quickly, much quicker than it was, was done before. And again, uh, where I fully agree with, with Hannah and, and the others is we in, in Europe, we should not advise Ukraine to give up and to surrender and whatever. It's the Ukrainian at the end who have to decide. We should support them, give them arms and every kind of support to fight against the Russian aggression. And it's very much true, and I say it everywhere, it's not only about Ukraine. Russian aggression in Ukraine would follow aggression in Moldova, aggression in Georgia, and maybe in other countries. So I think this is what has to be underlined again and again. It's not only in Ukraine. Of course, with Ukraine, it's... The, the most important thing, but for Europe, to defend Ukraine is a defense also of its values, its principles, and also its territory. To be very frank, also its territory. And for that, all the countries of the European Union must spend more on defense. Unfortunately, it would be better to spend it on other issues, but unfortunately, it will have to be also on defense. Thank you. Thank you, Hannes. Uh, James, you have a minute, and then I'll, I want to give the final word to, to Hannah. Okay, so I think just to sum up my remarks, I don't think this is about blame. It's not about blaming any particular country for doing this, that, or the other. Every country, to some extent, including the UK, including the US, for all I've said, um, share some, um, uh, you know, are responsible for some of the errors that we now uh, see uh, before us. What it is about is about understanding what those errors actually are, and understanding also that we're moving into a new era, um, which is not unlike very, dis very different from that that we've just come from in the 1990s, particularly in the 2000s. We face um, a Russia which is extremely aggressive and hostile and will do almost anything, anything to secure its uh, regime's uh, interests. That means we must move forward. Um, it means we must adapt accordingly. It means that we do need a strong European Union that stands up for its members and those beyond that might one day become members. Um, it, it means that we have to have a Europe that includes Ukraine it means also, I think, that we need a Europe that includes the UK and the US, and for that matter, also Canada, um, and is not exclusive. And finally, I think we must ensure that this Europe, while the regime is as it is in the Kremlin, does not include Russia. There can be no further discussions about European security architectures that include Russia, while the regime that has committed the atrocities that it has committed in Ukraine um, continues to live and, and prevail in the Kremlin. Um, thank you. Thank you, James. Hannah. 
Um, honestly, uh, not that much to be uh, um, added, uh, but uh, definitely, uh, you, you know, the phrase that we've been repeating for these three months is, so we are not afraid that our soldiers uh, will surrender. We're afraid that our partners will make us surrender. And uh, uh, that's why when we are talking about consequences, we need to understand that consequences are for all. It's impossible anymore to uh, uh, close the doors and windows and to say that this war is just Russian-Ukrainian war. Uh, it's never been and uh, uh, it will not be. And that is definitely not the Russian intention. And we see that as Russia is trying to provoke our European partners, they need to accept and to understand it. That even if Russia is not bringing weapons as to now intent to their territories, it doesn't mean that they are not uh, trying to destabilize the countries uh, through political confrontations, through energy, through economy, through disinformation, through media and uh, many other activities. So we know about this malign uh, influence uh, in many European capitals uh, for all these years, and we know that they just intensified. So that's why it seems to me that all that support that Ukraine is uh, receiving now should not be perceived uh, um, in Europe that it is some kind of gift for Ukraine, that it is the goodwill to provide it or not. Because de facto, uh, uh, like what I really don't like when we have the conversation, oh, if we will provide Ukraine with more weapons, probably the third world war is coming. Uh, that's stupid. It's absolutely stupid because that is already European war. Uh, maybe not world war, uh, but that is uh, that is over the European war. That's about European values. That's about sovereignty. That's about sovereign choices of the nations, of the people, of the states. And that's about the principles and the readiness to defend these values and principles. As soon as we understand it, um, probably some of the uh, uh, European politicians will be a little bit more um, ready uh, to support the sections, because supporting Ukraine means making this war shorter. And in this way, you can be very practical. Uh, the more support Ukraine received now and at once without any hesitation, there are higher chances that this war would finish earlier. Because the frozen conflict it is the last thing both Ukraine and Europe needs. Because as James said in the very beginning, the longer conflict is, the better it is for the Russian Federation. And the worse it for Ukraine and uh, our Western partners, because they will need to spend more. They will feel uh, longer consequences from migrants to economic consequences to the social uh, stability. And that is not the situation that all of us want. That's why it's really time to decide how much efforts we can take at once to make a big kick and to make the counterattack. So at least to return back to the situation of February 2022. Even that I would say uh, for sure that as for now, the Ukrainian population, and we have already several um, surveys um, demonstrating this, Ukrainian population will not be happy just with returning back to February 2022. Because we understand that uh, we have only one war that we should win, rather than uh, continuing or postponing the final decision of the issue. Um, that, but at least for the ceasefire, at least for the certain um, start of the negotiations, we are definitely talking about returning back to February 2022, when uh, we can start reconstruction, uh, returning of people uh, um, to our land, and uh, uh, talking with the Russian Federation about accountability, first of all. Because it's not defeat or not defeat, but it should be accountability. Accountability for killings and for the destructions. Otherwise, we are just allowing the middle ages uh, policies in the modern world. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Hannah. I mean, you, you said it very succinctly, many things, but you said supporting Ukraine means making the war shorter. And I think this is also something we need to keep in mind. And I think our debate has been about this, is how you get to that. Uh, each one of us has brought a different perspective. I, I, uh, I like you. I, I like all your comments. I thought this was a great discussion. I wish we had more time, but we will continue in this series of discussions. Next Tuesday, we will focus on what role for, for civil society in, in conflict zones, uh, because there's also that dimension uh, as well. So I look forward to, uh, we will be promoting this in the, within the next couple of days. Uh, I look forward to seeing all of you and continuing this discussion. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you, Hannes. Thank you, James. And thank you to our audience. Bye for now.